9 Unexplained Mysteries of the Jungle The jungles and forests of Earth have terrified the human race for years. There's just something unsettling about not knowing what could be lurking behind the next tree. That hasn't stopped us from exploring them and searching for the lost cities and treasures rumored to be inside. In recent years, the world has become a much smaller place, with everything mapped out in no location hidden from the satellites. However, the jungles still hold their secrets, with large amounts of land still unexplored, tribes unmet, creatures undocumented, and things never seen before hidden beneath their thick canopies. 1. The Amazon Rings. A series of square, straight and ring-like ditches scattered throughout the Bolivian and Brazilian Amazon were there before the rainforest existed, a new study finds. These human-made structures remain a mystery, they may have been used for defense, drainage, or perhaps ceremonial or religious reasons. But the new research addresses another burning question, whether and how much prehistoric people altered the landscape in the Amazon before the arrival of Europeans. People have been affecting the global climate system through land, use for not just the past 200 to 300 years, but for thousands of years," said study author John Francis Carson, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. For many years, archaeologists thought that the indigenous people, who lived in the Amazon before Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492 moved across the area, while making barely a dent in the landscape. Since the 1980s, however, deforestation has revealed massive earthworks in the form of ditches up to 16 feet, 5 meters, deep, and often just as wide. These discoveries have caused a controversy between those who believe Amazonians were still mostly gentle on the landscape, altering very little of the rainforest, and those who believe these pre-Columbian people conducted major slash-and-burn operations which were later swallowed by the forest after the European invasion caused the population to collapse. Carson and his colleagues wanted to explore the question of whether early Amazonians had a major impact on the forest. They focused on the Amazon of northeastern Bolivia, where they had sediment cores from two lakes nearby major earthworks sites. These sediment cores hold ancient pollen grains and charcoal from long-ago fires and can hint at the climate and ecosystem that existed when the sediment was laid down as far back as 6,000 years ago. An examination of the two cores, one from the large lake, Laguna Oricor, and one from the smaller lake, Laguna Granja, revealed a surprise, the very oldest sediments didn't come from a rainforest ecosystem at all. In fact, the Bolivian Amazon before about 2,000 to 3,000 years ago looked more like the savannas of Africa than today's jungle environment. The question had been whether the early Amazon was highly deforested or barely touched, Carson said. The surprising thing we found was that it was neither, he told Live Science. It was this third scenario where, when people first arrived on the landscape, the climate was drier. The pollen in this time period came mostly from grasses and a few drought-resistant species of trees. After about 2,000 years ago, more and more tree pollen appears in the samples, including fewer drought-resistant species and more evergreens, the researchers report today. July 7, in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Charcoal levels also went down, indicating a less fire-prone landscape. These changes were largely driven by an increase in precipitation, Carson said. The earthworks predate this shift, which reveals that the diggers of these ditches created them before the forest moved in around them. They continued to live in the area as it became forested, probably keeping clear regions around their structures, Carson said. It kind of makes sense, he said. It's easier to stomp on a sapling than it is to cut down a big Amazonian tree with a stone axe. The discovery that the human activity came before the forest answers some questions, like how Amazonian people could have built in the rainforest with no more than stone tools, they didn't have to, how many people would have been necessary to construct the structures, fewer than if clear-cutting had been required, and how the population survived, by growing maize. The study also has wider implications for the modern day, Carson said. The question of how to preserve the Amazonian rainforest is difficult to answer, some people say humans need to get out, and others believe people and the forest can coexist. Ancient history could provide a guide, 
as well as a greater understanding of how the forest has recovered from earlier perturbations. The Amazon also drives climate as well as responds to it, thanks to its ability to take up carbon from the atmosphere. The new study suggests that the modern forest is a co-production between humans and nature, Carson said. Natural cycles drove the rainforest to sprout, but humans stayed on site for 1,500 years afterward, he said. It's very likely, in fact, that people had some kind of effect on the composition of the forest, Carson said. People might favor edible species, growing in orchards and things like that, or, altered the soils, changing the soil chemistry and composition, which can have a longer-lasting legacy effect. Those long-range changes are next for Carson and his colleagues to investigate. This kind of study has only just started in Amazonia, Carson said. 2. The St. Lee's people. They may well be the last humans left on the planet, who remain totally isolated from modern civilization. But rare footage has emerged of the indigenous St. Lee's tribe, located on North Sentinel Island in the Indian Ocean which is so hostile to visitors that nearly every attempt at contact with them, in the past has been met with violence. Two fishermen were slaughtered by the Sentinelese in 2006 for drawing too close, and tribesmen have been known to fire arrows, and fling rocks at low-flying planes, or helicopters on reconnaissance missions. In a collection of footage from the mini-documentary, which has racked up close to 2 million views on YouTube, Members of the tribe are seen gesturing in a clearly aggressive manner at cameramen who were hoping to interact with the tribe. As explained by the narrator on the video, compiled by Love Bite Productions, the Sentinelese are thought to be direct descendants from the first humans who emerged from Africa, and have lived on the island for more than 60,000 years. It's almost impossible to say how many of them remain on the landmass, which is about the size of Manhattan and is part of India's chain of Andaman Islands but estimates have come in at anywhere between 40 and 500. It doesn't matter whether you are a friend or enemy, whether you arrived on purpose or by accident, the locals will greet you the same way with spears and arrows, the narrator states. Gifts of food and clothing are of no importance to them. Indeed, following the 2004 tsunami, which hit several regions of the Indian Ocean, helicopters from the Indian Coast Guard were sent to help the Sentinelese and drop food parcels, one of the tribesmen responded by firing an arrow at the rescue team. In 1967, the Indian government begun making attempts to contact the Sentinelese, led by anthropologist T. N. Pandit, who would leave the tribe gifts and try to signal to them. Sometimes they would turn their backs to us, and sit on their haunches as if to defecate, Pandit remarked of his mission. This was meant to insult us as we're not welcome. In March 1970, Bandit's group found themselves cornered in their boats, after coming too close to shore. An eyewitness from a different boat reported at the time, they all began shouting some incomprehensible words. We shouted back and gestured to indicate that we wanted to be friends. The tension did not ease. At this moment, a strange thing happened. A woman paired off with a warrior and sat on the sand in a passionate embrace. This act was being repeated by other women each claiming a warrior for herself, a sort of community mating, as it were. Thus did the militant group diminish. According to the documentary's narrator, there has only been one instance in which outsiders did not have to face an aggressive reception. On January 4, 1991, 28 men, women and children approached Mr. Pandit, and his group without hostility before retreating into the forest in a gesture he called incredible. Indian authorities have since made it a crime to try to make contact with the Sentinelese. It is illegal to go within three miles of the island. But the waters surrounding the island appear to be under threat by illegal fishermen. Survival International reported in 2014 that it had received reports that fishermen are targeting the area, with seven men being apprehended by the Indian Coast Guard. One of the fishermen reportedly stepped foot on the island in close proximity to the tribe's members and he managed to leave unscathed. The group, which advocates for tribal people's rights, describes the Sentinelese as the most vulnerable society on the planet, as they are likely to have no immunity to common diseases such as flu and measles. Due to their complete isolation, the chances of them being wiped out by an epidemic are very high, according to the organization. 3. The Mysterious Stone Spheres of Costa Rica 
found deep in the jungles of Costa Rica in the 1930s were 300 nearly perfectly round stone balls. They varied in size from a few inches in diameter, to 7 feet across and weighing 16 tons. Scientists aren't sure who made them, how old they are or what purpose they might have had. In the early 1930s the United Fruit Company started searching for new space to plant their banana trees because their plantations on the eastern side of Costa Rica, in South America, were threatened by disease. On the western side, however, not too far from the Pacific Ocean they found a promising section of land in the Dukas Valley. When they started clearing the land, however, workers found something strange, stone balls. They ranged in size from a few inches to six or seven feet in diameter. The most striking thing about these rock spheres was, that many of them appeared to be perfectly round and very, very smooth. Undoubtedly they were man-made. As far as the United Fruit Company was concerned the strange objects were just in the way of their plantation. Workers rolled them off to the sides of the fields by hand or pushed them using bulldozers. Many were eventually transported to homes or businesses to be used as lawn ornaments. Before authorities could intervene a rumor, that some of the stones contained gold in their cores caused treasure hunters to drill holes in them, load them with dynamite and blow them pieces hoping to get rich. The only thing they found inside the stone spheres, however, was more stone. The first archaeological investigation of the spheres was done by Doris Stone a daughter of a United Fruit executive and later the director of Costa Rica's National Museum. Her observations were published in 1943 in the magazine American Antiquity. A few years later in 1948, Samuel Lothrop of the Peabody Museum at Harvard University, while on an expedition to Costa Rica on an unrelated matter, ran into Stone who told him about the spheres. Lothrop, whose expedition was blocked from its original goal by a civil war, visited the Dukas Valley instead and did an examination of the rock globes. While most legitimate archaeologists have no doubt the stones are the work of an ancient indigenous people, wild stories have grown up about the spheres suggesting that they are connected with aliens or the lost continent of Atlantis. Skeptics argue that primitive people with basic, non-metallic tools could not possibly have made such perfectly round and smooth stones. However, Though many of the stones seem startling round, most of them are not as perfect in shape as they might appear to the casual observer. The best measurements were made by Lothrop in the 1950s, but he was hampered in his observations by the size of the larger spheres, and the difficulty of getting a tape measure around the spheres still half buried in the ground. Also not all the balls are perfectly smooth, and many show the evidence of the tools used to make them. Even if the stones are neither perfectly round or smooth, creating them was still a huge effort. Most of them are composed of green odiorite, a hard, igneous rock that comes from outgroping in the foothills of the nearby Ilamanca Mountains. Most likely the carvers carefully chose boulders that were somewhat round in the first place. This type of rock tends to flake off in layers if there is a rapid temperature change, so the carvers may have heated sections with hot coals then douse them with cold water. After using this method to get the general shape, the final sculpting was probably done by hammering the stone with other smaller stones made of the same hard material. Finally the surface of the spheres were ground and polished to a high luster using sand or leather. The same process is well known today for shaping smaller stone objects like stone axes and statues. The Kaurauga Indians are often cited as making the stone spheres, but they lived further north from where the balls were found. We don't know exactly who created these globes of rock, but it seems likely it was the ancestors the people who lived in the region at the time of the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. They would have spoken the Chibjan languages, unlike the Kaurauga who spoke Otomangian, and would have lived in dispersed settlements consisting of less than 2,000 people. They would have made their living by hunting, fishing and farming. They probably raised such plants as beans, squash, papaya, pineapple, and avocado. How old the spheres are is also a question that is not easily answered. Since rock is not living material it cannot be dated by using a radiocarbon test. However, it is possible to date objects found buried around some of the stones. This is usually pottery. 
Certain styles of pottery were known to be used during specific periods. This evidence suggests that the stone spheres might have been made, as early as 200 BC all the way up to when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century, a range of 1800 years. While this is most likely set of dates, it is possible that at least in some cases the stones were made earlier, then moved, or reshaped at a later date which was then associated the pottery style of that era. Probably the most difficult question to tackle is what were these stones sphere used for? Given that we have no written records from the culture that made them, the best way to figure out their purpose would be to see how they are positioned in relation to each other, and other archaeological artifacts like buildings and walls. However, most of the balls have been moved from their original sites at this point and there are few, if any, records about exactly where they were found. There are some documents suggesting that groups of the spheres were found in geometric arrangements like lines, triangles and parallelograms. However, since they are no longer in these positions it is impossible cannot confirm these accounts or make new measurements these stories, however, have led to speculation that they might have been used as compasses, or to make astronomical observations. Another theory is that the balls were used as status symbols. According to John Hoops, of the University of Kansas, who visited the stones in an effort to have them protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the making and moving of the balls was probably an important social activity, perhaps more important than possession of the finished product. We believe that the balls may have sat in front of the houses of prominent people, perhaps as a display of power, of esoteric knowledge, or of control over labor. There are records indicating that some spheres were found on the tops of mounds which might validate the idea that they were to be displayed as symbols of great status. Ironically, today the balls, some of which now sit in as diverse locations, as the private residences of the wealthy in Costa Rica to the courtyard of Harvard University's Peabody Museum in Connecticut, may still be doing their original function, marking the properties of the rich and powerful. 4. The Boiling River for centuries, Peruvian locals have talked about a river in the Amazon that burns so hot it can kill. According to legend, Spanish conquistadors foolishly ventured into the rainforest in search of gold, and the few men that returned told stories of poisoned water, man-eating snakes, and a river that boiled from below. For Peruvian geoscientist, Andres Ruzzo, the myth had fascinated him since childhood. But it wasn't until he was completing his Ph.D. project on geothermal energy potential in Peru, that he began to question whether the river could actually be real. According to the experts he spoke to, the answer was a unanimous no. After all, hot rivers do exist, but they're generally associated with volcanoes, and there are no volcanoes in that part of the country. But when Rezo went home over the holidays, and asked his family where the myth had come from, his mother told him that the river didn't just exist, she and his aunt had actually swum in it before. It sounded pretty ridiculous, but in 2011, Ruzzo took a chance and hiked into the Amazon rainforest with his aunt, and saw the famed river with his own eyes. Much to his disbelief, it was steaming hot. When I saw this, I immediately grabbed for my thermometer, said Ruzzo in a TED talk back in 2014. The average temperature in the river was 86 degrees Celsius, not quite boiling but definitely close enough. It's not a legend. The most puzzling part was the sheer size of it. Hot springs aren't uncommon, and thermal pools get to these temperatures in other parts of the world, but nothing even comes close to the scope of the river, it's up to 25 meters wide and 6 meters deep, and runs burning hot for an incredible 6.24 kilometers. Add that to the fact that the river is 700 kilometers from the closest volcanic system, and the temperature just didn't make any sense. In fact, it's the only river of its kind anywhere in the world. With the permission of the shaman, Ruzzo has spent the past five years studying the river, its surrounding ecosystem, and its water in the lab, in the hopes of figuring out what's going on. To be clear, Ruzzo obviously wasn't the first to discover the river, and as suggested by its indigenous name, Shane Atempishka, which means boiled with the heat of the sun, he also wasn't the first to wonder what made it so hot. But his research, backed in part by a National Geographic Young Explorers grant, is finally revealing some of its secrets. It turns out, it's not the sun that boils the water, 
but fault-fed hot springs. Imagine Earth like a human body, with fault lines and cracks running through it like arteries. These Earth arteries are filled with hot water, and when they come to the surface, we see geothermal manifestations, like the boiling river. Chemical analysis has revealed that the water in the river originally fell as rain. Russell now hypothesizes that this happens far upstream, perhaps as far away as in the Andes, and along its journey seeps down into the ground, where it's heated up by Earth's geothermal energy. It eventually emerges in the Amazon, at the boiling river. This means the system is part of an enormous hydrothermal system, the likes of which haven't been seen anywhere else on the planet. Even more exciting, Russo has worked with biologists Spencer Wells and Jonathan Eisen to sequence the genomes of the microbes living in and around the river, and discovered brand new species that are able to survive the heat. Of course, as fascinating as the river is, it can also be deadly. The water gets so hot that Russo has regularly seen animals fall in and slowly start boil to death. The first thing to go are the eyes, he explained in his TED talk. Eventually, the animals can no longer swim, and water fills their mouths and lungs, causing them to be cooked from the inside out. Gruesome. Still, people do actually swim in the river, as his mother claimed, but only after heavy rain falls when it's diluted with cold water. More often, the water is used to make tea and for cooking. Ruzzo will now continue to study the river and its source. But his main focus now is how to protect the river and its surrounding land. While his results are ready for publication, he's refusing to release many of them until the Peruvian government will guarantee they'll put appropriate conservation measures in place. In the middle of my PhD, I realized, this river is a natural wonder, Ruzzo told Matty Stone over at Gizmodo. And it's not going to be around unless we do something about it. He's just released a book called The Boiling River on his adventures, and is hoping that by spreading the news about the unique system, people might take on the cause themselves and decide that the site's significant enough to save from loggers and developers. I don't like the concept of one person leading this charge, I think it's about building a community on an international scale, said Ruzzo. The planet's gotten small, and natural wonders like this are few and far between. 5. The Lost City of Giants The discovery of the Lost City of Giants is one of the most incredible archaeological achievements in recent years. It is also one of the many ancient sites that according to mainstream scholars is unworthy of further research. It is believed that the discovery of the lost city of giants in Ecuador, is one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the 21st century. But not only is this incredible discovery of great importance, it is one of the many findings that have been omitted by mainstream researchers around the globe. Ancient legends in Ecuador speak of a time when giants walked on Earth, a time when these beings created huge megalithic cities, that have been consumed by nature thousands of years later. In this article, we take a closer look at this incredible finding by going through the most important details, about this enigmatic megalithic city. A legend that turned into reality. Even before discovering the ancient megalithic city, many local legends spoke of a time when incredible giant beings inhabited the remote region of Ecuador. These giants created megalithic sites, and this ancient city is just one of the many that are supposedly located in the region. In order to find the lost city of giants, a group of explorers teamed up with the locals who were well aware, and knew that this ancient city was, in fact, real. The aboriginals led the group of explorers to the site they consider truly holy, and local tribes gathered at the city of giants to celebrate powerful spirits which according to legend, still inhabited the megalithic site. According to reports, when the group of researchers arrived at the lost city of giants, they discovered a set of megalithic structures, the largest of the was a 260 foot tall by a 260 foot wide pyramid at an irregular angle. The massive pyramidal shaped structure is believed to have been made by huge boulders weighing no less than 2 tons. Located on the top of the pyramid is a flat polished stone which is believed to have been used a ceremonial or sacrificial stand. It looks like a paved wall, an ancient street or plaza with a 60 degrees angle, perhaps the roof of a large structure, said French-American archaeologist Benoit Duvernel. Many of the stones were perfectly aligned, have sharp edges and seem to have been sculpted by human hands. 
According to the group of researchers who discovered the enigmatic giant pyramid, the structure's body was apparently covered by lichen, even though the remaining visible boulders revealed a thick layer of impenetrable material that held the stones together. Many believe that this mysterious material is evidence of the first concrete-like material used in Mesoamerica. However, the structures found at the City of Giants weren't the most impressive discoveries. According to archaeologists, the most important discoveries made at the site were the oversized and odd manufactured tools which remained on the site for an incalculable time, blending in with nature. The size of the tools would make it impossible for humans to use them. According to Bruce Fintom, writer, researcher and member of the team that found this presumed city of giants, this is the ultimate evidence that proves giants inhabited Earth in the distant past, and built incredible cities and structures, what really strongly points towards this habitation having housed the same race of giants if the presence of extremely oversized hammers, or at least the stone hammer heads, he said. Assuming there were attached to hardwood handles they would be both incredible size and weight, making their use as tools impractical for a typical Inca or indigenous Indian, these beings were generally around 5 feet or so. Mainstream scholars believe the city is non-existent. Interestingly, despite the numerous discoveries, in 2013, when the Ecuadorian Ministry of Culture sent their representatives to investigate the lost city of giants, they concluded that the pyramid-shaped building was nothing more than a natural formation. However, Fenton and his team believe the intricate boulders, the complex pattern, and their fine assembly are clear indications that the enigmatic lost city of giants is not a natural formation but one of the best pieces of evidence that support the theory that in the distant past, giants walked on Earth. 6. The Stone Head of Guatemala Over half a century ago, Deep in the jungles of Guatemala, a gigantic stone head was uncovered. The face had fine features, thin lips and large nose, and its face was directed up at the sky. Unusually, the face demonstrated Caucasian features, which were not consistent with any of the pre-Hispanic races of America. The discovery rapidly attracted attention, but just as quickly it slipped away into the pages of forgotten history. News of the discovery first emerged when Dr. Oscar Rafael Padilla Lara, a doctor of philosophy, lawyer and notary, received a photograph of the head in 1987 along with a description that the photograph was taken in the 1950s, by the owner of the land where the head was found, and that it was located somewhere in the jungles of Guatemala. The photograph and story was printed in a small article in the newsletter Ancient Skies, which was picked up and read by well-known explorer and author David Hatcher Childress, one of our guest authors at AncientOrigins.net, who sought out to discover more about the mysterious stone head. He tracked down Dr. Padilla who reported that he found the owners of the property, the Benner family, on which the monolith was found. The site was 10 kilometers from a small village in La Democracia in the south of Guatemala. However, Dr. Padilla said that he was in despair when he reached the site, and found that the site had been obliterated. It was destroyed by revolutionaries about 10 years ago. We had located the statue too late. It was used as target practice by anti-government rebels. This totally disfigured it, sort of like the way the Sphinx in Egypt had its nose shot off by the Turks, only worse, he said. The eyes, nose and mouth had completely gone. Padilla was able to measure its height as between 4 and 6 meters, with the head resting on the neck. Padilla did not return again to the site due to armed attacks between government forces and rebel forces in the area. The destruction of the head meant the story died a rapid death until it was picked up, again a few years ago by filmmakers behind Revelations of the Ma, June 2012 and beyond who used the photograph to claim that extraterrestrials have had contact with past civilizations. The producer published a document written by Guatemalan archaeologist Hector E. Magia who wrote, I certify that this monument presents no characteristics of Maya, Nual, Olmec or any other pre-Hispanic civilization. It was created by an extraordinary and superior civilization with awesome knowledge of which there is no record of existence on this planet. However, far from helping the cause and the investigation into the monolith, this publication only served to have the opposite effect throwing the whole story into the hands of a justifiably skeptical audience who thought that it was all just a publicity stunt. 
Even the letter itself has been drawn into question with some saying that it is not genuine. Nevertheless, it appears the giant head did exist, and there is no evidence to suggest the original photograph is not authentic, or that Dr. Padilla's account was false. So assuming it was real, the questions remain, where did it come from? Who made it? And why? The region where the stone head was reported to have been found, La Democracia, is actually already famous for stone heads which, like the stone head found in the jungle, also face skyward. These are known to have been created by the Olmec civilization, which flourished between 1400 and 400 BC. The Olmec heartland was the area in the Gulf of Mexico lowlands, however, Olmec style artifacts, designs, monuments and iconography have been found in sites hundreds of kilometers outside the Olmec heartland, including La Democracia. Nevertheless, the stone head depicted in the 1950s photograph does not share the same features or style as the Olmec heads. The late Philip Coppins, Belgian author, radio host and TV commentator on matters of alternative history raised the question of whether the head is an anomaly of the Olmec period, or whether it is part of another, unknown, culture that predated or post-dated the Olmecs, and whose only artifact identified so far is the Padilla head. Other questions that have been posed include whether the structure was just a head, or whether there was a body underneath, like the Easter Island statues, and whether the stone head is linked to any other structures in the region. It would be nice to know the answers to these questions. But sadly it appears the publicity surrounding the film revelations of the Ma in 2012, and beyond only served to bury the story deeper into the pages of history. Hopefully an ambitious explorer will pick up the story once again and investigate further to find the truth regarding this enigmatic monument. 7. The Disappearance of Michael Rockefeller Captured on a small cine camera as it plays across the ranks of 17 approaching cannibal war canoes, the image is fleeting but unmistakable. Among the massed ranks of dark-skinned headhunter tribesmen heading around the bend of a New Guinea river is a naked, and bearded white-skinned man, his face partly covered in war paint as he paddles furiously. The appearance of a white face among a throng of Papuan cannibals would be astonishing at the best of times. But in the circumstances in which this footage was shot, it is potentially mind-boggling. For the impressive scene was filmed in 1969 close to the spot where, eight years earlier, a scion of the Rockefeller dynasty, the richest, most powerful family in U.S. history, had gone missing, sparking the biggest hunt ever launched in the South Pacific. Since 23-year-old Michael Rockefeller disappeared during a trip to collect primitive art from one of the remotest corners of the planet, rumors swirled about his fate. The official explanation advanced by the former colony's Dutch rulers was that he drowned, after he tried to swim to shore from his capsized boat. Others insisted he met a more horrible fate, killed and eaten by cannibals seeking revenge on white men for a Dutch attack on their village. Now, a documentary made by Fraser Heston, son of actor Charlton Heston, has thrown a focus on this extraordinary story once more. And, tantalizingly, newly unearthed film footage of the mysterious white canoeist suggests an astonishing possibility. Instead of being killed and eaten, did the Harvard-educated American reject his civilized past and join a tribe of cannibals? The riddle started in 1961 when the young graduate swapped his entitled Manhattan life for the privations of Dutch New Guinea. Now part of the Indonesian province of Papua, it was one of the wildest, most remote places on earth, populated by people largely stuck in the Stone Age. A keen anthropologist, Rockefeller wanted to supply his father Nelson, governor of New York and later Gerald Ford's vice president with exhibits for a museum of primitive art he had just founded. Occupying 10,000 square miles of jungle swamp on the southern coast of the Dutch colony, the Esmat tribes were ferocious headhunters, but they also made stunning wooden sculptures, rubbed with the blood of those they killed, as well as hauntingly beautiful decorated skulls. These they collected from tribal foes, having eaten their brains in a sacred ritual they believed would give them the dead men's power. Their bloodthirsty way of life revolved around endless revenge attacks against neighboring villages. Each time a tribe member was killed, he had to be avenged by taking the skull of an enemy, whether man, woman or child. Whites were generally safe from this tribal war, and Rockefeller spent six months there, 
writing home about the amazing art he had acquired and his fascination with hazmat culture. His father later said his restless son had never been happier. But things were about to change forever. On November 17, 1961, Rockefeller was traveling up the coast, a region of dense rainforest, mangrove swamp and crocodile-infested mudflats known as the Land of Lapping Death, when his small catamaran capsized in rough seas. Two teenage native guides immediately swam towards shore, around nine miles, to get help. Following a very uncomfortable night spent clinging to the submerged craft, an impatient Rockefeller stripped to his underpants, strapped together two jerry cans for buoyancy and struck out for land, telling his companion, a Dutch anthropologist, I think I can make it. They were the last words he is known to have uttered. The Dutchman was picked up the next day, but his companion was never seen again. The hunt was exhaustive. His father chartered a Boeing 707 and flew a media army out to the region. Thousands of locals joined a search involving dozens of ships, planes and helicopters. But no trace was ever found, and after 10 days his devastated father gave up. Dutch officials presumed that Rockefeller had drowned. But he had been a strong swimmer, the sea was calm, the tide was pushing him to shore and the local sharks weren't man-eaters. Rumors persisted that he had reached land. Then, in 1968, New York Magazine editor Milt McLean flew out to Papua and launched a months-long search. He discovered a retired Dutch missionary, Cornelius Van Kessel, who had been living in the Asmat area when Rockefeller disappeared. The priest told McLean an extraordinary story, a week after the last searchers gave up, he started hearing tribal rumors that the American had been caught and killed. The reason, he claimed was that three years before Rockefeller disappeared, a Dutch police patrol had come to a village called Otsjanep to sort out a tribal headhunting war. Fearing they were about to be attacked, the police opened fire, killing five village leaders. By their sacred code, the tribe had to have revenge and take a head, a white man's head like that of the patrol's Dutch leader. That was easier said than done. Then, one day, a group of some 50 Otsjanep men were returning home from a trading trip when they finally got their chance, a white man, exhausted and unarmed, swam towards their canoes just offshore. One of the tribesmen was said to have stabbed him fatally with a 10-feet fishing spear, before they hauled him into a boat and took him to shore, where they chopped him up, cooked him and ate him. The priest said the tribesmen admitted they had killed him as revenge for the police raid. Dutch officials disputed the story saying that missionaries were unreliable. Besides, sneered one skeptic, an even more bizarre story had leaked out, that Rockefeller was still alive, and kept as a white idol by a tribe near the coast. So what was the truth? Last year, a new book revealed that two Dutch missionaries had sent detailed reports of the murder to the colonial government and the Catholic Church, even identifying which headhunter had kept parts of the American's skeleton. Though magazine editor Milt McLean favored the theory that Rockefeller had been killed and eaten, he didn't dismiss the possibility he had survived. White men were regarded as wielders of powerful magic by Pacific tribesmen. When the Allies left the region after Japan's 1945 surrender and stopped dropping air supplies, or cargo, so-called cargo cults sprung up on islands such as Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu. The tribes venerated the Western goods, including canned food, mass-produced clothing, weapons and medicine, that had so drastically altered their lives, and built mock landing strips and lit signal fires in the expectation the Westerners would return. The son of an immensely powerful white man could have made a strong magic totem for any tribe if he conveyed to them who he was. Could the story about Rockefeller's murder have been a cover-up, hiding an even more extraordinary fate? Milt McLean didn't have a permit to travel in the Asmat region, so he sent photographer Malcolm Kirk. It was Kirk who shot the footage of the white-skinned canoeist, but then McLean allowed it to languish for more than 40 years in an American warehouse, until documentary maker Fraser Heston found it. Heston's documentary is called The Search for Michael Rockefeller. He was researching a screenplay based on Milt McLean's book about Rockefeller's disappearance when he found around 15 reels of uncut film and sound tapes. It is not clear why it had been gathering dust in a New England vault, but it is believed McLean, who died in 2004, 
felt he didn't have enough footage for a documentary. Malcolm Kirk told me yesterday that he did not believe the mystery man was Rockefeller, though he hadn't noticed him at the time. I can't say I was particularly aware of a light-skinned figure in one of the canoes, but I do recall coming across a reference to an albino male when I glanced through my journal a few weeks ago, he said. While he, too, favors the cannibal theory, Fraser Heston is not so sure that the white canoeist can be automatically dismissed. This shot of a bearded, light-skinned Caucasian paddling in a canoe full of naked asthmat warriors begs more questions than it answers, he says in his documentary, noting that the asthmat don't wear beards. The resemblance to Michael Rockefeller, an accomplished canoeist who wore a beard, is obvious. And if it wasn't Rockefeller, assimilated into the Asmat's cannibal culture in the preceding seven years, as Heston suggests, who was it? In this outlandish tale, where anything seems possible, it is not an unreasonable question. 8. Amazon Rainforest Alien In 2011, two British tourists visiting Brazil's Mamos region accidentally captured a picture of what appears to be an extraterrestrial being. The being was spotted in the background of a picture taken by a renowned paranormal writer Michael Cohen. The shape of the being does not resemble any life form currently known to mankind but does appear humanoid. What makes this mystery even more chilling is the fact that the area is known for frequent UFO sightings, with many speculating that aliens are interested in the area due to its biodiversity. The region was also targeted by a high-level Brazilian government investigation, Operation Prato, in which the army was sent to monitor an alien presence in the region. As biologically diverse as the Amazon is, this peculiar creature would not appear to be a natural inhabitant of the Brazilian jungle or, indeed, Earth for that matter. Standing just a few feet from a mesmerizing flashing light, this unidentified being could offer proof that we are not alone in the universe. The image comes from a video obtained by noted paranormal writer Michael Cohen and is claimed to have been filmed by two British tourists visiting the Mamos region of the Amazon. While the camera is focused on some young children, seen in the distance behind them is a silvery light. However, it is only when the eyes are diverted to the surrounding jungle does it become apparent that there is a small being standing side on just to the right of a tree, appearing to arch its back. It is the unmistakable form of an alien. No explanation is offered as to what the light may be. While for many the images can simply be dismissed as a well-executed hoax, Mr. Cohen, who runs the noted paranormal website AlansWeb.com, suggests the photos go some way to proving the existence of aliens. He said, this is highly compelling footage that will be hard to discredit. It comes from an area known for experiencing intense UFO activity. It is rather apparent that aliens are interested in this region due to its biological diversity. The area was also the focus of a high-level Brazilian government investigation known as Operation Prato, where the army was sent in to monitor and confirm an alien presence in the region. He said the Brazilian government denied there was an Operation Prato for years before conceding it did occur and released large amounts of files associated with it. Having obtained the footage, Mr. Cohen, who is well known within UFO and paranormal circles, was inundated with requests from Hollywood producers keen to use his proof. This footage will be used in direct collaboration with an American film and will serve to highlight this as proof of this footage's veracity, he said. 9. Flesh-eating parasite. Legend has it that the locals fled Honduras city of the monkey god, in the 16th century fearing that it had been cursed with disease. 500 years later, a group of explorers excavating the lost city, became the latest victims to incur the wrath of the monkey god, when they nearly lost their faces to a flesh-eating parasite. The parasite migrates to the mucous membranes of your mouth, and your nose and basically eats them away, Doug Preston, an author who documented the trip, said. Your nose falls off, your lips fall off, and eventually your face becomes a gigantic, open sore. The group, made up of American and Honduran explorers and archaeologists, announced they found the lost city, also known as the Ciudad Blanca or the White City, in 2015. The city earned its name, according to American explorer Theodore Mord, because of indigenous legends stating it contained a giant buried statue of a monkey god. Mord claimed to be the first to find the lost city after returning from an expedition, 
but died before he could return. Other legends speak of it as a White House or place of cacao from which no one has returned, according to National Geographic. After spending years searching, the team found the city's ruins in the 32,000 km Muskisha rainforest, with a stroke of good fortune. Searching through the thick vegetation with the assistance of a laser mapping system proved unsuccessful, until the city was found when crew members noticed stone structures barely sticking out of the ground. Preston told CBS News that months after leaving the jungle, he noticed a bug bite that simply wouldn't go away. And so did half his team members. Eventually, the National Institutes of Health diagnosed them with leishmaniasis, a parasitic disease, and the team was forced to undergo treatment. The disease was contracted from sand fly bites. Once bitten, the parasites within the bugs can enter the human bloodstream, and begin eating away at the immune cells that normally kill bugs. Initial symptoms include fever and vomiting. If left untreated, leishmania can result in horrible disfigurement. But long before they were infected with leishmaniasis, the explorers nearly fell victim to the lethally poisonous snakes infesting the area. When a pit viper called the Ferda Lance made its way into their camp under the cover of darkness, a jungle warfare expert snapped into action. He pinned the snake, Steve Elkins, one of the explorers, told CBS News. But the snake exploded at that point into an absolute fury of striking everywhere, squirting venom, streams of venom across the night air. Between the thick cover of vegetation, disease and venomous snakes, it would seem the monkey god was striking back at the outsiders for their attempts to find the long-lost city. In reality, the curse and resulting exodus from the White City coincide with a Spanish invasion in the 1500s that brought with them a wave of both slavery and disease. Before Preston and his crew discovered the city, it had remained one of the last unexplored places on the planet. Within the city's ruins, the team removed dozens of artifacts carved from stone and clay, including trays and a throne. Many were sculpted with snarling jaguar heads. It was one of the jaguar heads sticking out of the ground, that first drew the attention of the explorers. The artifacts date back to 1000 and 1500 AD. Preston knows there are more secrets held within the White City's ruins but after nearly losing his face, he doubts that it's possible to go back and continue the excavation. It's just too dangerous, he said. And just getting in and out is dangerous.